Slim hot queens with them next to nothing on While a feller tries to hold down the 50 bucks for a job of one foot. It must be nice never to wonder about why they have to bring them up, watching your face to the old and tired of what you marry. And then to never really wonder, I mean, about the smell of baby. How you know the damn rent's good. And to never, never, never stand at no window because I can't see it. Smoking sounds like a rent. And to never, never, never stand at no window because I can't see it. Smoking sounds like a For the first time in my life, I made an impression. Something that With the recitation of that I've grown up. Nevertheless, I was shipped off to boarding school college. I beat them up, getting cold type of place. It was run by a <laughs> it was run by a Victorian headmaster who was inspiring. He, he could make ancient history come out. He also could draw a map and camouflage on the blackboard, freehand, with every major plan included in the world. He'd come into the classroom with a book of poetry and read Tennyson's Ulysses. Slam the book shut and then say, Listen to me. But it was not until I came here, Bishops, in the late 1950s, and met uh, Professor Arthur Moore, that I was truly transformed by the power of God. There were only six of us in this class, um, and we sat there waiting for him to arrive. And suddenly he burst into the door ten minutes late with his gown flowing behind him, his hair, what little he had, uncombed, and his shirt half unbuttoned. And he wheeled around and said to us, when I was a wind boy, the black spit of the child beside the moon. I tiptoed shy in the Rude owl cried like a tail of tail. I skipped in a blush as the big girls rolled. Nine came down on the donkey's common, and on seesaw Sunday nights I ruled whoever I would with my witch The whole of the moon I could love them leave. All the green leaves little kitties on the sides. I went on to recite all five verses of the promises of the man. And then he walked across the room, collapsed into a chair, and sat staring out the window. It seemed for a very long time. And then he turned to us and he said, Well, the interesting thing about Kevin Thomas's poetry, I think, 
is that he uses combinations of words which never scrutiny and don't seem to make sense. But when they're combined in the verse, they actually supercharge the meaning. Dylan Thomas is able to make music words that reach beyond definition. I decided right then and there that I was going to take every one of the professor regions for it, it, it appeared to me that poetry would be something that would last and be more powerful and go beyond and survive the future career in business, midlife crisis, and the growing demands of family life. When I left university, the realities of life left me with little time for poetry. And it wasn't until many, many years later that I, after my business was sold, I was out of a job, and I faced true change. I, I decided that I would fly a small plane to Peter's Hill to Africa and spend two and a half years there working for the flying doctors. And it was on those long solo flights that I rediscovered the joy of reciting the poetry. It was, you might say, a tap. And when I returned to Canada, to my dismay, I found that poetry for the public had really fallen out of fashion. With a few exceptions, it was no longer Thomas Elias, seldom read, and almost never recited. It was as if poetry had receded back into a fringe activity. By contrast, in the States, poetry seemed to be vibrant with, with poets like John Ashbery, Billy Collins, Adrian Rich, and so many others. And in other places in the world, poetry seemed to be alive and well, especially places like Latin America or Eastern Europe. There were public poetry readings that were attended by large and enthusiastic I remember being on a business assignment in Romania. <laughs> Hello, my name is Jessica Riddell and this is my co-host Sally Cunningham. Sally is a second year honors English major and also the Tomlinson intern for the Office of the University Principal. This is our seventh year for TEDx Bishop's U. It is a remarkable weekend because we get to invite our Maple League colleagues from the other three campuses to explore a theme with some great depth from very different kinds of angles. We started the weekend with the remarkable Sally Armstrong, who took us through her journeys, her adventures, advancing the rights of young women all around the world with a particular focus on the developing world. She inspired us, she made us laugh and cry and sing, uh, and was a wonderful foundation for which to spring to the things that we explored today. The business case competition, which is ongoing, 
the debate tournament, which has just wrapped up, and culminating in the TEDx Bishop's View this afternoon. We are welcoming remarkable faculty and students from our four universities who will take us on their own individual journeys and adventures around young people advancing human rights. This is a particularly powerful theme for us as institutions of higher learning, particularly in the Maple League, where we believe that higher education has a responsibility to train engaged and wonderful and ethical citizens of the world. We're going to hear from very different perspectives what that looks like and how you can anchor that in practice. As part of the messy journey of organizing an event in the winter between the Maritimes and Quebec, we have lost irresponsibly two of our speakers due to inclement weather. Dr. Andrew Nurse, who is a faculty member from Mount Allison and the Chair of Canadian Studies, was going to talk to you today about the importance, even urgency, of the humanities and how we can anchor that in advancing human rights. He has promised that he is our faculty speaker for next year, and we are taking him up on that. We also are missing Ferio Sala, who is a remarkable student from St. of X. She grew up in a refugee camp in Somalia. This is her second year in Canada as a nursing student at St. Francis Xavier. She will come next year, she will be remarkable, and she will be able to tell her story. But I just want to mark those as two really wonderful speakers who we will see and you will look forward to next year. So Sally is going to perform a land acknowledgement, and then I will introduce the first speakers. The Maple League acknowledges the indigenous peoples and their lands upon which we teach and learn. We recognize the Abenaki people and the Wabanaki Confederacy at Bishops and the Mi'kmaq and Wollastook Maliseet at Acadia, Mount Allison, and St. Francis Xavier Universities. The indigenous peoples are the traditional stewards and protectors of the territories occupied by our universities. One of the core values of the Maple League is to respond to the recommendations of the Truth and Reconcili Reconciliation Commission and to work with diverse communities to indigenize the academy and decolonize higher education. So our first speakers are the first time that we have invited two speakers on for the same talk. And this dynamic duo is certainly remarkable on their own, but remarkable in our seven year history for TEDx Bishops U. They are inextricable, uh, linked with their vision to take over social media and to disrupt the narratives and to model messy journeys and to live life unfiltered. They are both in their fourth year in business, in the Williams School of Business at Bishop's University. They're twins, they're dynamic, and they have taken social media by storm. I joined Instagram for them. I believe Michael Goblum has also joined Instagram because of them. Uh, so it is my distinct pleasure to welcome to the stage uh, Tegan and Keisha Simpson. Please welcome them. <laughs> If you spent the day around people who were seven feet tall, would you begin to feel short? If you spent the day around people who walked twice the normal speed of you, would you feel slow? Probably most of us, if not all of us, would answer yes to these questions. As young women, we are constantly fed images of beauty and perfection on social media. Every hour of every day, we are shown the most beautiful and happiest moments of our peers. And like anyone, we are affected by this. A study conducted in 2018 found that the greater use of social media is strongly correlated with a lower self-esteem and a greater need for belonging. We see ourselves as relative to our surroundings. Our self-view is greatly affected by our peers. My name is Keisha, and this is my sister, Tegan. Being twins, we have felt the pressure of comparison both on Instagram and between each other. Today, we want to address the issues with social media, how they are affecting young women, and what we believe is a potential viable solution. On Instagram, I post photos that portray a really exciting life. I look happier than reality, and frankly, prettier than I actually am. I have photos of me traveling, helping kids in Africa, dancing at a Taylor Swift concert, and of course, 
lots of photos of my friends. My Instagram account shows snapshots of my life, or aspects of it. My happiest, most beautiful, and exciting moments. And that's all. And this is the norm. Most young women, if not all of us, do this. Social media's culture encourages us to share a highlight reel of our very best moments. And while there's nothing wrong with this in itself, it does contribute to an inaccurate belief of what our lives are actually like. So yes, most of us are aware that photos we see are often staged, edited, or filtered. We all know this, but we also forget. Scrolling endlessly, inundated with picture-perfect photos, our unconscious mind compares our lives and flaws to the perceived perfections of others. I can't tell you the number of times I've thought, if I was her, I would be so happy. I'm comparing my life to complete strangers, people I know nothing about beyond their Instagram. And these comparisons are dangerous. In fact, it's been proven. The Journal of Communications conducted a study which found that the use of social media increases a young girl's obsessive surveillance of her own body. Guilty. Here's the thing. If we only post one photo a week, then it's probably our highlight. We probably look happy, beautiful, and suggesting that we're having a lot of fun. At least, these are the types of photos I post. Now, each week has 168 hours, or 10,080 minutes. So if we post just the very best minute of our week, then it's not an accurate representation of what our week was actually like. It excludes everyday stuff like waking up early, going to work, being bored in class, watching Netflix. It doesn't show the regular moments of our lives, let alone the tough ones. Here's an example of a photo from my own Instagram. This is a photo of an event at our school, a much anticipated night where everyone goes all out, sporting the most fashionable outfits. I bought a brand new dress, spent two hours on my hair and makeup, and then another hour with my friends taking photos in our living room. The crazy thing is, I didn't even go to the party. After these photos were taken, I stayed home crying by myself because I didn't feel beautiful. Feeling confident in my body is something that I struggle with a lot. My point, though, is you wouldn't have known this based on this photo. In fact, if you were to judge who I am solely based on my Instagram account, you would have an inaccurate idea of what my life is actually like. Instagram is not always what it seems. Last winter, I realized that social media was affecting my self-esteem. More specifically, I was comparing my biggest insecurity, which is my legs, to other girls' legs on Instagram. So as a result, I decided that I would delete the app in the hopes that removing social media from my life would help me overcome this. But this didn't work because a week later, I just re-downloaded it. And even after a few attempts, I could not remove it. So I tried a different strategy. I followed a variety of Instagram accounts relating to body positivity in the hopes that they'd bring perspective and balance to my own feed. But none of these accounts worked because they all had one single thing in common. They were telling me that I was beautiful. They were telling Keisha Simpson that her legs were perfect just the way they were. In theory, this is a great message, but it doesn't actually work. At least it didn't for me. Telling me that I am beautiful just the way I am is my mom's job. <laughs> but hearing this generic message, it really did little for my self-esteem. But do you know what did help me? Hearing that a girl that I thought was beautiful also had insecurities. Understanding that my peers also felt this way, now that was helpful. So I began searching for an account that showed this, an account that I could relate to with real young women who presented themselves fully with insecurities and struggles. But this account did not exist. I never found it. So that is why we have decided to create it ourselves. Live Life Unfiltered. Live Life Unfiltered is a brand, an Instagram account, and a social media movement. 
This campaign was designed to remind young women that beyond these perfect photos is still a girl with insecurities and bad days. We want to encourage females to relate and understand our similarities instead of comparing our differences. Social media pressures are real. Acknowledging this is key. So is talking about it. So let's continue the conversation. To clarify, we are not suggesting anyone delete Instagram. We are not down on selfies or posting. But instead, we want to improve the Instagram experience for young women. We want to diminish the negative impact by bringing a fresh perspective to our feed. We have created an Instagram account where we post photos daily of young women that are unedited, unfiltered, and not posed. These photos are paired with pertinent captions that reflect the woman's feelings towards social media, body image, and her relationship. Showing a side women typically do not share online. So for the last few months, we've been setting up our Live Life Unfiltered photo booth on different campuses in Ontario and Quebec. We approach strangers and briefly share our story and movement. In no time, women typically open up, relating to us on a personal level from similar experiences and mutual understandings. Through genuine conversations, we capture quotes and images of hundreds of young women, none of which are filtered or staged. We want to add a fresh look to our Instagram feed, bring back a healthy perspective, and remind us all that there is a relatable story beyond the posts. And so, we officially launched three months ago on November 1st. The progress and support that we have received from other young women has by far exceeded our expectations. In addition to launching our Instagram account at Live Life Unfiltered, we also launched with a photo challenge that introduced our hashtag, as she is. This was a simple uh, photo challenge that encouraged young women to post an unfiltered photo to our hashtag and to nominate two of their friends to do the same. Now, truthfully, we were hoping for maybe 50 girls to participate, over 700 posted in the first few days. Most of these were Canadian university-aged females. But since then, we've had young women participate in 14 different countries. We were taken by the number of women who took the time to participate, but even more so by their willingness to share not just an unfiltered photo, but by opening up genuinely and honestly, admitting to insecurities, stress, and the pressure to post a perfect photo. This is a girl who participated in the As She Is Challenge and who has agreed to let us share her photo. Now obviously, this young woman is absolutely beautiful. But on November 1st, what she posted was very different from anything she has ever shown online before. In her caption, she discloses her biggest insecurity, facial acne. She speaks to her use of multiple filters and to carefully positioning her face to hopefully hide her acne. On November 1st, when she came forward and was transparent on Instagram about her own insecurities, others were able to relate. Her vulnerability and willingness to share helped to remind others that it's okay if you do not feel beautiful or confident all the time, because no one does. Now clearly, this is not the type of thing she would typically post. But on November 1st, this woman, along with 700 others, chose to live life unfiltered by participating in the As She Is Challenge. This is just one example. There are so many other posts just like this. The thing is, individually, I would not have had the courage to share what I posted on November 1st. But because I was not alone, but with a group of young women, I was able to do it. Brave together as a group, we were able to go against Instagram's culture and bring perspective to our followers' feed. Our mission is to have the As She Is Challenge spread across North America and bring a refreshing perspective to Instagram. The thing is, Tegan and I alone can never make this happen. But with a group of 100, 
200, 1,000 other young women. There is nothing we are not capable of. We realize this, that as a team, we can make change. Instagram is a value tool in today's society, essentially a necessity to our culture. But from our experience of talking to hundreds of young women, it can come at a cost, natively affecting our self-esteem as we endlessly compare. But what if we can change that? What if Instagram became a place where we can share our life without these pressures or expectations for the photos to be perfect? What if we all realize that no one feels happy, beautiful, or confident all the time? What if a team of young women came together to change the way we use social media? What if we lived life unfiltered? Thank you. Our next speaker is Colin Mitchell, a fourth year honors student from Vancouver, BC. He came to Acadia to take advantage of the full Maple League experience. Small classes, beautiful towns, and cutting edge research opportunities. He hopes to continue his education with a master's in international relations and eventually pursue a career in Canadian politics. Please welcome to the stage, Colin Mitchell. To reaffirm faith in fundamental human rights, in the dignity and worth of the human person, to promote social progress and better standards of life in larger freedom. These are some pretty powerful words. They were written 74 years ago as the preamble to the UN Charter, meant to unify the world after years of deadly conflict. The reality is that today we seem further from these than ever before. All around the world, human rights are sacrificed on the altars of privilege and power. Going through the headlines and taking a look at your phone rarely makes it better. If you ask maybe 10 of your friends about the state of the world, the likelihood is that nine of them are going to say, it's getting worse, that there's no hope. Why should I go to university and learn about anything when the world is just going to be a darker and darker place? Respectfully, I disagree. Young people today face a crisis of confidence when looking for jobs after graduation. To make a lot of money and live a comfortable life is one thing, but to have a career that really fulfills you, that really means something, that's another. And careers in human rights offer a solution. After all, there is nothing more fulfilling than helping your fellow human, no matter where they are, all around the world, uplift themselves and achieve the best that they can. Unfortunately, careers within the human rights sphere or on the wane. After all, international organizations like the UN, like NATO, like the World Bank, often don't pay their interns. This instead pushes them to rely on unpaid labor, gratis personnel, and this has de disastrous consequences, especially at the UN in particular. Just last year, one intern was found living in a tent in a park in Geneva, another in an office basement. This then creates another crisis of confidence within the very, these very international organizations who need young people now more than ever before. So what can we do? Well, let's start at the grassroots level. People are cynical about international organizations because they fail to stop things when they're small. Why don't we utilize Maple League precedents to change that? After all, our universities are predicated on innovation. Together, we can achieve some great things. What if we were to come together to teach artificial intelligence for the defense of human rights? Now, this could mean a lot of things. We could be monitoring food stocks via satellite imaging or compliance with ceasefires. We could utilize drones to ensure that aid is delivered to conflict-ridden areas, no longer jeopardizing the lives of peacekeepers or aid workers alike, and creating careers for undergraduates who often face saturated markets. But the question then becomes, well, I mean, why us? You know, why the Maple League? 
Surely this is the kind of thing for a bigger, wealthier institution like U of T or UBC. Not necessarily. There are precedents for this kind of innovation. For its time, the Acadia advantage was huge. Everybody had a laptop computer. This meant that anybody, anywhere, at any time could access anything available on the internet. Now, today we take for granted just how big this was, but in 1996, when the Acadia Advantage officially rolled out, this was revolutionary. This was a game changer. And in 2004, Acadia topped McLean's annual rankings for innovation. But since then, we've suffered. What made the Acadia Advantage so unique was that it changed how concepts were applied. It's one thing to learn an abstract theory in class, but it's another thing to see it in action. In 1996, this meant a conjugation software for the French department, or a lab support software for the physics department. Ask yourself, what could this look like in 2019? Maybe this looks like simulations that run global supply chains, or 3D printing a human heart to understand the intricacies of the valves. So if you're to ask yourself, what can we do in 2019 to mirror the kind of innovation that we saw in 1996, where do we start? Well, combined with the Antigonish movement, there is some serious potential for change. Formed in the 1940s as a result of the poverty afflicting farmers, fishermen, and miners alike, the Antigonish movement and its fundamental tenets still ring clear today. Social reform through education, education through group action, education about economic reform, social reform fundamentally altering education and economic and political institutions. In the 1940s, these principles were meant to uplift maritimers from economic depression. But in 2019, I propose that we utilize these principles together to teach the world about artificial intelligence for the defense of human rights. What if the Maple League were to come together to create a brand new program, the Bachelor of Artificial Intelligence, or BAI? Now, this is not a new revolutionary concept. In fact, it's already being done at the Indian Institute of Technology in Hyderabad, teaching everything from the algorithms to the ethics that make AI possible. But what we can do, what we can do differently, is that we can utilize our precedents for innovation and technological progress and come together to utilize AI for the defense of human rights, teaching the next generation not just of Canadian leaders, but of global leaders as well. The Maple League specifically is in a very unique place to do it. After all, our institutions are predicated on innovation, togetherness, and collaboration. And we're already moving in the right direction. Courses on genocide and justice, or time, have shown that we can work together. We can teach one another. What if we were to utilize the same kind of progress, the same kind of techniques, to integrate our curriculum, to teach AI for the defense of human rights? Just think about it. Just imagine. Courses teaching how to utilize drones to deliver blood to rural hospitals, or how to crowdsource the best algorithms to maximize agricultural yield, or seminars debating the ethics of AI law. If a car hits uh, someone crossing the street, but there's nobody driving the car, who's at fault? There is a lot of potential for that. Now, the reality is it's going to be slow, and it's going to take time. And I know firsthand, I have sat on the Board of Governors and at the Senate, of Acadia, and I know that these things are going to be horrendously slow going e through each institution. But that is why it is so important that we do this together. And we're already on the right track. Obviously, coming here this weekend is indicative of our ability to work together for change. But what if we're to work with international organizations as well? After all, we have some of the best co-op programs in the country. What if we were to, with our Bachelor of Artificial Intelligence program, work with international organizations to send co-op students off for a semester at the UN, at NATO, at the World Bank, to not just learn more, but to apply the concepts that they've already learned and to work together to achieve fundamental change in the defense of human rights all around the world. Now, leveraging historic partnerships is going to be crucial to creating this atmosphere. Most of our institutions have links to the Carnegie or Rockefeller foundations. What can we do there? Well, what if we worked with think tanks like the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, 
fun and we could ask ourselves, how can we fundamentally alter the process of conflict resolution by incorporating AI? We can work with provincial and federal governments alike to ensure that our small, primarily residential towns have the ability to become incubators for artificial intelligence by working with provincial and federal governments. We could also change on our small scales how we deliver basic services like health, education, public transport. There is a lot of potential here for change. But more so, there is the ability for us to work together to ensure that we future-proof our students. By learning the ins and outs of AI, we effectively ensure that we have a seat at the table when the majority of our workforce becomes automated. Now, it'll be hugely important, obviously, to learn the arts side as well. After all, Stephen Hawking's partner, Sir Roger Penrose, noted that human understanding cannot be encapsulated computationally. This, quite simply, means that we are still going to have a seat at the table 5, 10, 15 years from now. We're still going to be incredibly active and we're still going to be crucial in decisions, even if we're working alongside robots possessed by artificial intelligence. But the Maple League is in a very specific spot right now. We occupy a very specific niche within the post-secondary landscape. But by incorporating artificial intelligence into our curriculum for the defense of human rights, we can make the world a safer place. We can ensure that we are creating students not just for the market, but that we can ensure that we are creating students for the 21st century. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jelaine Beren, a fourth year sociology honors student at Mount Allison University. She's the social justice coordinator for the Mount Allison Student Union and an intern with SHARE, the Sexual Harassment and Assault Response and Education Center. Jelaine's interests include academic writing, playing board games, fawning over dogs, and building community through justice work. She's very excited to spend today with you all. Please welcome Jelaine Beren. So I'm going to start my talk with my favorite fact. Flamingos are, on average, between three and a half and four and a half feet tall. So not small, especially for birds. However, I learned recently that the average flamingo weighs only between seven and eight pounds, and the heaviest ever recorded flamingo weighed only 9.9 .9 pounds. So you have a bird that's like this tall and that weighs about as much as an average house cat. And this, when I learned it for me, was really wild stuff. It was really mind blowing and I hope it's changed your perspectives a little bit about flamingos. <laughs> um, but, and I promise we'll come back to them later. But for now, I want to tell you a little bit about me. As you heard, I am a sociology student at Mount Allison University, and I am in my fourth year of my undergraduate education. I work on social justice initiatives with the Students' Union, and a lot of my work right now focuses on sexual violence, prevention, awareness, and education. I always thought my journey through university would be linear. Growing up, I was good at school. It was almost easy for me. I was never good at any sports or music or art, not for lack of trying, but I was good at school, and I figured university would be the same. You know, I would know my major from the start, get a perfect GPA, graduate in only four years, and come out the other side with a job that, where they pay me just tons of money, waiting. But that has not been the case. That is not my story. I started out my undergraduate degree at Yale and US College in Singapore, on the other side of the world. And I was all ready to follow that perfect linear trajectory. But then life hit me, as I know it does a lot of students. I was 18 years old, living so far away from home, dealing with mental illness, general university stress, an intense fear of missing out, lack of sleep, and a distinct feeling that I had no idea what I was doing, but that I was struggling. 
Even though I knew for the whole first two years of my undergraduate degree that I was struggling, when I finally made the choice, first to take a gap year, and second to transfer to Mount Allison, I felt like a failure. There were so many people thriving at my old university, so why couldn't I? And I was so uncomfortable with this feeling of uncertainty, with this break in this linear plan that I had constructed for myself, and I didn't know how to sit with it. And one day, I realized, after sitting with my discomfort for a while, that maybe, instead of trying to end it, I should live with this discomfort because it might be necessary for me to grow and change. And here, believe it or not, is where we're going to come back to the flamingos. <laughs> so when I realized that being uncomfortable was important in order for change to happen, it really shifted my perspective and changed the way that I looked at my life. And similarly, although in a less monumental way, when I learned that flamingos were that big and that small all at the same time, I really felt my perspective shift. And when I realized that I wasn't a failure for transferring universities, but that was just my journey, I realized that my perspective had been shifting over time, and I just hadn't noticed it yet. But now, as fascinating as the flamingos in my life are, I, I want to talk to you about how this all relates to social justice work and social change. So, social justice work, is a part of the field of sociology, which is what I study. And so I'm going to talk to you first about sociology, because I love me some sociological theory. But there's a particular little branch within my discipline called figurational sociology. Figurational sociology emphasizes that we, as individuals, are not disconnected from each other or from society, but rather that there is a series of interconnected and interdependent relationships between us and everybody else. And this means that the paths that we choose to follow are informed by society's expectations of us, but that we continue to uphold these expectations as we follow these same paths. And the linear journey that I personally wanted to follow through university was one of these paths. I knew what I expected for myself, and I never questioned it. I never questioned why I wanted to do it, even. And this really threw me off when it all fell apart. One of the reasons that I love sociology is because it's given me a little toolbox of questions to ask about pretty much everything. So who is benefiting and who is losing? Who is making the decisions and who is being excluded? And then, of course, where's the money? And when I was asking these questions about my own life, I didn't know why I was doing any of it. I wasn't enjoying myself anymore. I didn't feel like I was helping anyone else. And I certainly didn't feel very connected to the world around me. And when it comes to money, we all know university can be a bit expensive. Um, and so it's from this point that I really turned hard towards social justice work, and where I really, when I started going to Mount Allison, got involved in a bunch of different initiatives and different kinds of work. And I found that these questions have really helped me at all stages of the work that I'm doing to think critically about it. I want you to know that in all of the work that I have done, and all of the work I have been able to see happen, I am very optimistic that change is not only possible, but imminent. The world that we are currently living in is full of injustices, and I refuse to believe that the world is just like this, or that inequalities are natural and unchangeable. I don't want to believe that injustice will always exist, or that change happens independent of what we choose to do and what we choose to believe in. And if we bring the ideas of figurational sociology back into this, where our current paths are upholding these systems of inequality, then I think that that signals a radical and important possibility for change. See, when I started thinking about my own life and I realized how uncomfortable I was with it, 
I had to work outside of my established boundaries in order to create a future that I wanted to live. And while this is easier to do on an individual level, I started applying this principle of working outside the boundaries and thinking outside of the boundaries in everything that I do, because I believe that that is how social change is going to happen. If our current paths are upholding oppression and injustice, then we need new paths, new ways of being and doing. Because social justice will happen when we start to think about ways that aren't rooted in deep-seated inequalities and deep-seated oppressions. So that society is only static if our actions are static. And therefore, we need to start, and a lot of people have already started, but we need to continue making new paths for ourselves. Because right now, when we ask these questions, we don't get great answers. And so the things that have always been done and the paths that have always been followed will need to change because following these paths has not liberated us from these systems of inequality. And all of the work that I have seen that has been done to make change and right injustice has been done because of grassroots work in young, queer, black, indigenous communities of color, poor, disabled, and immigrant communities who have dared to think and act outside of these unjust systems. But this requires a lot of hard work. It really does. And it can be really uncomfortable because the things that we take for granted and the paths that go walk unquestioned will need to change. And greater solidarity between movements will need to be built even more than it already is. But I think that if we start to think of ourselves not only as individuals, but as people located in complex interconnected relationships with one another, with society, and therefore with injustice, I think we can start to see how we can work together in our universities and in our communities to change our figurations and achieve something new. And from all of the work that I've been able to be a part of, even the little incremental changes that have happened, I know that this potential for radical change is not only necessary, but possible and happening. Now, there are two things that I need to say, um, because it would be reckless of me not to. It's easy to think, and if you're like me and you just like to throw yourself into things head first and get really involved, it's easy to think that your intentions are the most important thing, but I'm going to tell you that they're not. There are two things more important than anyone's intentions in this work. The first most important thing is to figure out what work is already being done and supporting it and uplifting it. Because there is so much great work being done and building solidarity means not creating competing initiatives, but rather uplifting marginalized voices, listening to those experiences, and not trying to be patronizing or not trying to take up unnecessary space, but really redistributing resources and providing tangible support for movements that are demanding change and challenging the injustices that we face every single day. The second thing that's more important than your intention is your impact. And one thing that I've started to do, and I invite you to do this too, is to take your little sociology toolbox and ask these questions. Who is benefiting and who is losing? Are your intentions, however good they may be, furthering oppression or causing harm in any way? Who is making the decisions and who is being excluded? Are the voices of the community that you are trying to support at the center of the work you are doing? Or are there voices missing from the table? And where is the money? Is there actual wealth being redistributed to underfunded communities? Or are resources being held and not changing? It is vital to ask these questions at all stages of social justice work. And I will admit that it is easier to say than to do, and that it's almost impossible to get right every single time, and that it will be highly uncomfortable, especially if you're passionate and have a lot of initiative. 
but it is so necessary. I want to live in a world that is just and equitable and right, but I don't get to decide all by myself what that world looks like, and I want to work together with others in order to build that world together. And so social justice really requires imagining a world where we are all better, where every single one of us and societies are better if every one of us within these societies is doing better. And I'm going to leave you with a final little tip. If you don't know how to deal with the great discomfort that comes with engaging in social justice work, just remember that giant tall flamingos are the size and weight of a small house cat. And that should be silly enough to help ground you back in the world for a bit to help us build a better one. Thank you. Dr. Jonathan Langdon has been working with social movements in Ghana for the last 17 years. At the same time, he has worked closely with renewable energy movements building across First Nation settler divides in Nova Scotia. He also worked on critical and decolonized approaches to a developmental studies curriculum. As part of this work, he's been helping to organize a youth activism conference at St. FX for the last eight years. He's an associate professor and the Canada Research Chair for Sustainability and Social Change Leadership at St. Francis Xavier University in Mi'kmaq, Nova Scotia, Canada. Please welcome jo Dr. Jonathan Langdon. My best friend's name is Coleman Agioma. And for more than 20 years, Coleman and I have been working together, trying to do what we can to make the world better through activism, teaching, and research. But more than this, we've been doing this work through an ongoing dialogue, deepening our friendship over the many years. I want to start by invoking this friendship and invoking Coleman's presence here, because he and I wouldn't even know each other if not for the commitment of my undergraduate university to experiential learning and to fostering relationships between students like myself at that time and community development workers and activists like Coleman. Because you see, Coleman lives in northern Ghana, and I met him through Trenton Ghana's program of experiential learning for one year, one academic year in Ghana. And over the course of that year, Coleman and I got to know each other and then gradually understand and appreciate each other better. He had years of experience working with marginalized communities in rural Ghana. And he became a mentor to me, a young undergraduate, middle-class white guy who, you know, was kind of engaged in the world, but at the same time was preoccupied by things like rowing, partying, and writing poetry. In the years after this program, as I returned to Ghana to help run the Trent program, and then do my PhD research, work on a decentralized governance project, and uh, contribute to an anti-privatization of water campaign, as well as develop a 10-year long relationship with social movements in Ghana, Coleman gradually shifted from being a friend, a mentor, to then a research partner. Now, this is not the only story of relationships developing like this in spaces like this. And these relationships defy how we come from different worlds. And in fact, suggest how these experiences enable us to understand the different worlds that we inhabit. I want to share this personal story because to me, relationships matter. And ensuring that our small liberal arts universities are fostering the kinds of spaces where relationships can form like this is, cru is a crucial role that we can play in building the next generation of youth activists to take on the challenges that are confronting our contemporary world. Challenges like runaway climate change, where environmental stability is a thing of the past, 
the rise of ethno-nationalisms and white supremacy that are targeting immigrant groups and others to blame for turbulence in their lives. Ongoing rape culture and the targeting of sexual minorities and the deep need for us to build a true nation-to-nation -nation relationship on this land between First Nations and settler communities and more. Well, for the last eight years at St. Evex, I can say we've been trying to build just such a space. And as a faculty member there, I'm really privileged to have been part of that effort. It, start, it started as a, um, an initiative with Dalhousie University's uh, International Development Studies Department. Um, but then it gradually morphed into our own youth activism conference every year. And we've had a number of prominent activists that have come to St. Evex to share their perspectives on change. And we've had roundtables and workshops and panel discussions on different topical issues and activist skills. Over the course of the last few years, we've shifted from being faculty-led, people like me, to being student-led and community-led. And for the past four years, we've actually been in an active partnership with St. of X's X Project, a 50-year-long commitment by our campus for outreach between our students, St. of X, and Mi'kmaq and African Sto and Nova Scotian youth from high schools and middle schools in nearby communities. Youth from those communities have actually joined our planning committee for the last couple of years. And they've helped us to make sure that we have programming that really speaks directly to the needs that they feel. And in fact, this year, based on feedback from that group as well as others on the planning committee, we've made changes to the conference. We're no longer having a full weekend. Instead, we're having a series of intentional and intensive workshops where we address things that are of interest to those who actually come. So this past weekend, we had a, a, a workshop on um, creativity in activism. And it was a very dynamic weekend. But the point that's really crucial here is that through all these efforts, what we're trying to do is both build spaces for activist skills and knowledge to increase, and at the same time, build spaces where relationships can form across lines of difference. And this last point is crucial. How do we imagine truly engaging with issues like reconciliation if we are not building spaces where youth who straddle the settler First Nations divide can come together in mutual dialogue and build relationships that can lead to understanding and maybe even friendship? How do we imagine tackling issues that are confronting African Nova Scotian communities if we do not build spaces for youth inside and outside those communities to come together in mutual dialogue? How do we imagine being part of a process of fostering the next generation of youth activists to confront things like climate change and anti-immigrant backlash, gender-based violence, if we don't have spaces for this generation to think listen and learn from each other and from others past this little bubble that social media has embalmed us in. Universities have been doing this, well, actually not universities, but universities have been spaces where this has happened. Relationships like this have happened and activism like this has happened. In North America, we can think of how campus-based really, um, activism has taken on things like workers' rights, has tackled fascism, has worked on women's right to vote, challenged conscription, conscription during the, the World Wars, um, you know, was part of the conversation around Quebec sovereignty has been a place where African-American civil rights was launched. LGBTQ rights 
indigenous sovereignty, the nuclear, the anti-nuclear and peace movements. These are all things that came out of campuses and more. At St. of X, sorry, no, at, um, first I wanted to talk about Ghana. So the place that Coleman and I work together, uh, student activism has also played a major role in shaping that country. Uh, student activists helped to bring about the revolution that happened in the early 1980s and were part of the move to democracy that replaced it in the 1990s. In fact, Coleman was part of both of those movements as a student. And he used to tell me stories about how his dorm room was decorated with bullet, mo bullet holes from those turbulent times. African universities have also been really, really crucial launching pads for the anti-colonial movement. Even as universities in places, uh, you know, the, at the center of empire were also crucial. At St. of X, student activism launching from our own confusion square has been central to change things like create co-ed dorms and more recently to insist on institutional recognition for things like LGBTQ Pride Week and Mi'kmaq nationhood. However, it seems that institutional recognition and far more important than that, institutional support for student activism by university administrations is pretty hard to find. In the 1960s, student activism in Europe and North America led to a giant wave of construction in campuses to create barriers to prevent activists to actually access faculty and administrators. More recently, China has cracked down on activism on campuses. While the fees must drop leaders in South Africa have been targeted for retribution by university administrators. Closer to home, at Dalhousie, student union leadership were uh, targeted for uh, disciplinary action because they spoke out in favor of Mi'kmaq sovereignty and against Canadian colonialism. And Dow's current interim president is embroiled in controversy for the way in which he has typified, quite negatively, student activism. Our own youth activism conference has also not been supported. In fact, our university rather paid me to we, a for-profit entity, to come onto our campus to run youth programming instead of working with the faculty and community organizations that are building locally relevant programming. MeToWe has been severely criticized for the way in which it is trying to profit off of the conscience of young people. At the same time, we're not seeing the kind of pickup and investment that we should around these kinds of issues. In this contemporary moment, when people are asking questions about what is the liberal arts mission? This is a moment where we could move from tolerating youth activism to celebrating and energizing it. Working with young people who are society changers, who have that sense of how to work across difference, who have that sense of how to understand multiple perspectives, who have that sense of how to build collective action. We could be supporting these students. But unfortunately, we're not. And I want to share what happens in spaces like this and coming out of them. Because the truth is, it's pretty electric. Last year, 
at the close of our Youth Activism Conference, the Mi'kmaq and African Nova Scotian youth who attended returned to their school Monday morning to find racist graffiti having been spray painted on their school and their school bus. Now, one of the youth who attended last weekend's uh, workshop and I, we, were, we were chatting about this and it's very clear to me that this, is, this incident is still deeply affecting them. But at the same time, the relationships that were built in the Youth Activism Weekend, as well as the way in which that weekend helped to deepen skills around articulating a critical thought, a critical thinking in the face of this kind of hate, played a crucial role in enabling these youth to emerge as the ones to frame the story and the interventions that have followed. Faculty involved in the conference also pushed Cinevex to issue a formal statement of support for these youth and for the communities that they represent, despite the fact that administrators resisted it initially, saying that this was a community issue. We also managed to constitute a space where we started a collective conversation about how we can change the historical legacy of inequality on our campus as well as in the communities that surround us. Members of the Faculty of Education also played a crucial role in working with the affected school, even as teachers who are part of the conference have played that same crucial role. Now, my point here is not to kind of pat ourselves on the back and say, oh, you know, well done. It's rather to point out what can happen when you have a collective space where people are coming together to work through these issues before a crisis happens. Desmond Cole, who was our guest speaker that weekend and who is a, an amazing activist, he made space on his radio show for youth from that community to speak and share what they were, not just what they were, they were feeling, but what they were doing to try to confront this issue. Nobody told these youth how they should react. Nobody told the campus how it should react. But because we had a collective space, we could actually find our way to building a reaction that changed the channel from hate to a story of courage and solidarity. But the thing is, this story also told me how our institutions are not supporting us the way they could. How they didn't pick up this plan that came out of this collective discussion. And how they haven't recognized that this space that we've created as faculty and as community and as youth is tentative. It needs support, it needs nurturing, it needs energizing. It's always, it can't always be on the shoulders of you know, all these other people. And so we really need to think about how our institutions, small liberal arts institutions, can play an active role in working with youth and their energy for change. And I want to end by going back to the beginning and reinvoking Coleman here. Um, Coleman is a, is a wonderful teacher. Uh, he'll be my teacher for life. Um, and he has a proverb that he shares on an ongoing basis. He comes from northern Ghana, and he says, uh, you don't throw blows when your legs are in the air. And I want to end with that quote, because I think it applies to this situation in two really clear ways. Number one, it's our job as small liberal arts universities to work with the energy of youth, the desire of youth to see change in the world and to see an improvement in the face of these challenges. But we need to work with them to help plant their feet 
in relationships, in skills and knowledges around activism that can enable them to move those levers of change effectively across lines of difference. And we need to understand this saying also for our liberal arts universities, because I would argue right now our legs are in the air. We are not effectively looking at the relationships that our youth have and need to have to really contend with the challenges in front of us. And we need to reorient and root ourselves in that process if we're truly going to see the kind of tomorrow where all of us can thrive. Thank you very much. Our next speaker, Laura Wilmo, is in her final year of international studies at Bishop's University. She combines her interests for political science and the environment by being involved on campus as the Sustainable Development Student Intern, and she's the executive of the Political and International Studies Club. Next year, she will pursue graduate studies in, in, oh my goodness, in environmental law or international law. Please welcome Laura Wilmo to the stage. <laughs> Raise your hand if you ate something today. <laughs> this is something we all have in common. The need to be fed daily. But too many vulnerable people do not get this right. I've always had an interest in human rights. As I traveled a lot, I was early conscious of all the inequality surrounding us. I don't know if it was part of how my parents raised me, but growing up with a brother and a sister, you always feel like your parents treat you in an unfair way. Oh, my brother got more, my sister got more. Well, I always had a bigger sense of that. Some people are born with less, and I think it's unfair. I know it's very privileged to say that, but I think that people don't have the same rights as us, and this is why it got me to wanting to be a seeker for justice to help my life. Last summer, I had the chance to do an internship in Brussels. I met with several other students from everywhere in Canada and the United States. And this is one of the main reasons why I love my university so much here at Bishops. Because this is an opportunity I had due to the politics and international studies department here with another student. And spending my summer sharing with other students about what passionate them made me realize what motivated me. We have the chance here at Bishops to be surrounded by amazing teachers. And some of them are even here in the room. But I really underestimated how much you can learn from fellow students. But I learned from the really broad social justice field where I wanted to personally make a change, where I wanted to pursue my career, and it's a right to food for all. So let me start with some facts and context here. Food waste is a global issue that affects all of us. Food waste creates 3.2 billion tons of greenhouse gases every year, which means that if food waste was a country, it would be the world's third largest polluter after the United States and China. In Canada, 30% of the food we produce is wasted. In Quebec, that means that we collectively waste 180 kilograms of food per year. The economic aspect of food waste is $400 per person per year. Can you imagine how much you could do with $400 as a student? Although there is enough food to go around the world to feed the global population, one third of the four billion tons produced each year is wasted. And that costs our global economy nearly $750 billion annually. The issue of food waste has economical, environmental, and social consequences. We cannot keep threatening such a sustainable future. If you want to save the world from hunger, start by not wasting food. So maybe all these facts are not really alarming you, so let me put it this way. Of all the food every year that is produced for consumption, one third is wasted. So one of my colleagues earlier used an animal to show her facts. Well, I used one too. One third of the food we consume, 
be raised every year is the equivalent of seven million blue whales. Can you imagine how much food that is? So these are very alarming statistics. How can we even begin to tackle such a massive issue? Today, I'm going to talk to you about food security and how we can improve this at home. And I hope that when you leave this room, you will take part of improving this human right as I do daily here in my community at Bishop's University and at my home. The answer to what can I do to solve this issue is to start local. For example, there's one community project I'm involved here on campus that is part of how I personally engage in this human right, and it's the BU Community Fridge. This fridge was the idea of my friend and alumna Camille Lamarche, that you can see on this picture, who graduated now two years ago. Camille had this idea for a while, but such as many good things in life, it takes time to implement projects. But I personally believe that when something is meant to do good in your community, it's worth the time. And this is why I was more than happy to get involved with her when she asked me to be part of this project at the beginning of this year. The city of Sherbrooke has a few different community fridges in the city, and they're called the Free Goes Free Go. But they all share the same mission, to reduce food waste by giving access to the most disadvantaged to fresh fruits and vegetables while fighting at the same time for food waste. And I think that's a very good example of human rights and human values and how people get in, can get engaged in their community. Because if you want to tackle a global issue, you need to start at the local level. I remember this fall when we launched the fridge, we gave to our community thanks to the generosity of our local member of parliament, Marie-Claude Bibot, who kindly donated us thousands of apples to share with our community. And I think we need more of that. It's cyclical sharing. You take into the fridge if you need it, and you give in it if you can. I remember last semester, I went to see a documentary called Just Eat It. It was about food waste and a Canadian couple who survived for six months by eating food only designed for landfills. This was very shocking to look at because it not only paints a picture of food waste in North America, but it makes you also realize how small you are. And the reality is there are thousands of documentaries about food realities around the world. But I think it should not take as far as an image of a young kid starving in a remote country for us to realize that some people do not get the right to food as we have. And that we all have the power here to take action about on that issue. The fridge acts as a metaphor and a reminder of what we can do when we fill someone's fridge. Food insecurity on campuses is the lack of reliable access to sufficient and affordable nutritious food. There are not enough studies here in Canada about food insecurity on campuses, but the one that are, have been done included that 48% of respondents reported food insecurity in the previous 30 days. Can you imagine going to class hungry? I personally couldn't follow a class of one of my teachers, no matter how passionate and interesting they are, being hungry. To tackle such an issue, we need human values such as fairness, equity, respect, and dignity, and models of those values that inspire people to get engaged. For me, it was several of my teachers here on campus, and my friend Cami, by her hard work to implement the fridge. Every human needs to eat. No one can be left behind in this fundamental human right. But the good news is that we are such a major, major part of this problem. We also have the ability of be the solution to it. We have the power here at our local level in your community, in every community of the Maple League universities to tackle this problem. And this is another of the reasons why I love my university so much, because it runs on student engagement. You get so much possibilities here at Bishop's University. My school is here, here really a creator of those values, but I'm sure that every school of the Maple League is. We really have a community of international students, and those international students, once they graduate, go back to the four corners of their world. They take the values we learned them here 
the values for my part that were not to waste food, but to share it. I really hope that next time you look at your apples in your fridge going bad, you will remember me and come drop them off in the sub. If ever you've never seen the fridge, it's at the heart of our campus, right in the sub. Education and awareness are the first steps to solving and understanding any issue. And world hunger is no different. I remember a quote I read a few years ago that really inspired me. If you're working on a problem you can solve in your own lifetime, you're not thinking big enough. Nevertheless, regarding human rights and the right to food, I really hope this is something I can see solved in my own lifetime and that the sustainable development goals targeted by the United Nations will be reached. If today I made the people here in this room more conscious about the problem of food waste, I reached my goal. And I really hope that you will continue this on your daily lives. Because if we tackle the problem of food waste, we could feed 9 billion people every day. Thank you very much. Our next speaker, Dr. Cynthia Alexander, has been investigating the adoption of computer technologies by Canadian government since the mid-80s. That early work evolved into assessing how new media technology can meet the policy needs and interests of First Nations and Inuit. She's grateful for the generous sharing of knowledge, time and hospitality by Inuit of Nunavut for opportunities to work with and for diverse Indigenous peoples and their communities and organizations over the past 30 years, and for the privilege of living as a guest on unceded Mi'kmaq territory. Please welcome Dr. Cynthia Alexander. <laughs> Did you hear about it? We, we made the New York Times yesterday. Headline of the op-ed, Canada. Canada is the moral leader of the free world. Did you catch that yesterday? Yeah. And we heard Sally Armstrong deliver the Donald Gordon lecture yesterday, yesterday evening. And we should feel good. We heard about Canada's role in saving some of the white helmets in Syria. We heard of how this country has accepted refugees from Syria. And indeed, we heard a young Bishop's University student from Syria get up during question period and say, thank you. Thank you, Canada. These are good deeds. These are our civic responsibilities on a global scale. We have the right, the responsibility to protect. Did you also hear the news last night? Colton Bushy's mother spoke. Colton Bushy. Do you remember his name? Colton Bushy, Saskatchewan, a year ago. A jury that was not reflective of the ethnic diversity of the province of Nova Scotia did not reflect any indigenous jury members, decided that the point blank murder of Colton Bushy was not something that could be decided with a guilty verdict. Tina Fontaine, Tina Fontaine, same thing. Do you remember the Globe and Mail headline that caused some of us to shudder? Right when that jury came back and found a not quick guilty verdict, some of us shuddered because the Global Mail headline was victim blaming. Right. Then, within the last month or two, we've also learned that some Indigenous women in this country have experienced forced sterilization. And then there might be names. We've heard, maybe, and we might have forgotten, Edward Snowshoe, a young northern indigenous man, 
came south, went to Winnipeg, had some alteration with the law, and ended up in prison. Starting to recollect this story, and ended up in solitary confinement for over a hundred days. He was then transferred to an Edmonton penal institution. Somehow the paperwork got lost. And he was submitted to solitary confinement again for a long period of time. And as in Winnipeg, in the prison, so too in Edmonton, he tried dying by suicide. And in Edmonton, he was successful. And an Edmonton judge concluded in an inquiry that this was inhumane. And yet, if you go and do any kind of search, you'll find we still, in this country, are having long periods of solitary confinement, especially with Indigenous populations. Did you know that the number of Indigenous women who are incarcerated has grown by 50% in the last decade? Did you see how many First Nations communities still don't have fresh drinking water? Do you remember Shannon? Do you remember Shannon's dream from Atahuapiskat? Do you remember Shannon came south? She went to Parliament Hill. She said, please, please, can we have a school like everybody else? Right? And it was children in Toronto who said, hey, these kids don't have schools. Right? Did you read Tanya? Talaga's book, Seven Fallen Feathers. Toronto Star journalist who goes up north to Thunder Bay during our last federal election, looking for a story related to the election. And the Grand Chief says, hey, did you hear? Did you hear? Right? So we've heard. And I want to ask you how you feel now. We just heard we're the moral leader of the free world. And I just burst the bubble. But it's, I'm not sharing any secrets. These do make headlines. They are on our social media Twitters, on Facebook. But somehow we turn the page, right? 1996, we had the costliest, most comprehensive Royal Commission, the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples, which delivered over 400 recommendations. Some of us in this audience may remember what happened to that Royal Commission and all those reports with all those good recommendations after all that thorough study? It was shelved. More recently, yes, we've had the National Truth and Reconciliation Commission with its 94 calls to action. Hmm. Do you remember? Among those recommendations, the final report says that our schools, our colleges, our universities have and are part of the problem and need to become part of the solution. Here's my university, the heart of it, University Hall, historic building flying the Mi'kmaq flag, as every school and university in Nova Scotia now is. This is a good step forward, undeniably. But what else do we need to do? Guess what? It's our students who are showing us what we need to do, not those of us who are academics, administrators, and staff trying to come up with programs and policies and strategic plans. It's our students we need to listen to. They're the ones who are showing us the way. They're the ones that I've seen have the compassion, who take the time, as we do in liberal arts institutions, to look at what they choose, what they're willing to commit to, what are their convictions. And then they have the courage, because it's a tough journey to get out of the sticky web of what Jeff Corntassel and Tayaki Alfred call shape-shifting colonialism. And we are all colonial subjects, right? So what are we going to do? Are we going to wait for the justice system, for the health care system, for our education systems to come up with strategic plans. Tick tock, tick tock. We don't have to wait. This is uh, my colleague, Beverly McGee. And Ms. McGee is completing a PhD at the University of Victoria after a lifelong career as a health professional, both in senior management as well as on the ground in clinics and hospitals. She's worked in northern communities and she's worked 
in northern Manitoba and Nunavut. She's worked with and for Indigenous peoples. Together we started asking some questions. And one time we were at my kitchen table and we were asking the question, because we keep seeing the same stories, the same problems, and yet no real action. We said, how can we open hearts? And at my back door, Elder, Mi'kmaq Elder, Dr. Doug Knocker just showed up. And it is elders who warm our hearts and breathe life and give us courage and inspire change. One of the things you'll learn about today is that in working with Inuit of, of Nunavut, not of Canada, because even our prepositions are colonial. Inuit of Nunavut, not Nun Inuit of Canada, Inuit in Canada. And sitting down with then Premier Eva Ariak and the Commissioner of Nunavut, Pita Irnuk, for three days we were asking, what are the research questions you think we need to tackle? And yes, there's a housing crisis. Yes, there's food insecurity. Yes, there is a suicide epidemic. But the top priority for Inuit, as we heard at that table, was to connect youth with elders. And you may know, of course, this is an aging society among the general population, but the Inuit population, the indigenous populations, are overwhelmingly under the age of 25. So you heard me start with some of the stories of this last week, this last month. And these stories, these headlines repeat themselves. And they repeat themselves in our own back here, backyard here, coast to coast to coast in Canada, and in the United States, and in Australia. And what you see here in red is Aboriginal health compares badly with Indigenous communities in other developed countries and was even worse than in some third world countries. We've had a UN Special Rapporteur come and investigate the human rights violations across Canada that persist. And Dr. James Anaya delivered his report a couple years ago, and it did make headlines, saying Canada's in for a crisis because of these overwhelming human rights violations. It gets to the core of being human. It's about basic humanity. It's about basic human rights, the rights to shelter. In Nunavut, for example, where there's an ongoing housing crisis. And we could look at the stats from Stats Canada. I believe in 2012 it was that Nunavut needed 3,500 housing units. And we know that in a couple hundred square feet, Inuits share, multiple families share the same space and take turns sleeping on the couch. And we know that this leads to other crises, such as a tuberculosis epidemic in our own backyard. And we can imagine what it's like to be a child, a youth, and try to go to school when you're taking turns sleeping, right? Maybe you even saw the news in December of a young Inuit family that pitched a tent outside the beautiful Legislative Assembly, trying to draw attention to the housing crisis. And the father says, I didn't want to do this for my family. I had to explain it to my little girls but I have to do something. So as we look at these issues, and I remember in 2006, st the Statistics Canada headline was X number of children, I believe it was four out of 10 Inuit children under the age of six were going hungry. The latest statistic, look at this tweet, 2019, this year, 70% of children in Nunavut go to bed hungry. I don't think we can say that statistic often enough. So we started sketching. I want to know what you're feeling now. I know what I'm feeling. This feels overwhelming. We're going, why does this happen in our own backyard, in a country that, 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 that is a leader in the G7, and as we just heard, a, a, a moral leader in the free world? What we found is there can be reactions to the sorts of news that I just shared with you, the sorts of statistics, the dirty statistics that I just shared with you. And it can range from unproductive emotions. And I've seen that among my students, anger, shame, guilt. I prepped for today by reading 
my students' journals from my Thursday class. And I read them before bed last night, and I saw an international student who wrote, I, I'm in shock. And I, saw, I read another student from Canada saying, I didn't know. I feel shame. I feel guilt. I'm overwhelmed. They're avoidance strategies, as we saw with the, the Global Mail Tina Fontaine headline, victim blaming. There's paralysis. This is too big. We've got to rely on our prime minister. We've got to rely on our premiers. We've got to rely on our university presidents and senior administrations in the face of what we need to do. And there's discomfort about these ongoing human rights in our own backyard. So started playing about what's going on. And you've seen the books. There's a book with the title, Compassion Fatigue. But then we started thinking about studied forgetfulness willful blindness. How can we explain that these problems persist, these human rights violations? And we came up with what we call the D-squared framework. And it's a guide. It's a compass. It's a path. And I and my colleague, Beverly McGee, owe our students with whom we've, we've collaborated over the years in, the, in and out of the classrooms in coming up with this path forward. And this is what we've seen students do. And at first we drew it left to right. And we started with what we call the default mode of shape-shifting colonialism, where we see denial, we see delusion, we see defensiveness. Well, they should get over it. Come on. And in this case, we've used the words IK for Indigenous knowledge or IQ for a specific set of Indigenous knowledge among Inuit. Inuit Hayumenik to Kanjanit which refers to Inuit ways of being, knowledge systems that evolved over thousands of years, principles, consensus-based decision-making. What you can see is every single word means something carefully. So at the bottom of the default mode, the red mode, the sticky mode, the mode that we are comfortable with, we see willful blindness. We see mere tolerance. We see awareness. Do you see that big gap? I'm sorry. Do you see that big gap right there between the red and the green? There's a big difference between awareness of these issues and interest in these issues. So what you'll see, if we came up with four stages and 12 steps upwards, you can recognize that Indigenous peoples do have knowledge systems that influence environmental stewardship, consensus-based decision-making, restorative justice, and that these systems of sustainable communities evolved over millennia. You can see that still at the green stage, for curiosity about you have the words understanding of. The challenge is you could have a PhD in Indigenous studies and still not give a damn. And that's why we move into connection with starting to be sensitive to, to engage with, to appreciate. And then as we move up to, to the deliberative side, to deliberative democracy, we get into our civic duty. Once you know, what are you going to do about it? And that gets into respect, reciprocity, and restitu restitution. So we applied this to our own research in Nunavut, and we came up with narratives based on a combined total of 50 years working with and for Indigenous peoples. And we showed the sort of narratives, and it might not be consciousness, and you've got a handout of this, of what willful blindness looks like, what tolerance looks like. And this can apply in any profession, in any community. And then we ask questions that helps the person get out of that sticky web of the default mode. And again, we've been asked as a country to decolonize ourselves. We cannot reconcile unless we decolonize ourselves. And universities have been part of the problem and need to become part of the solution. And so this is a quotation from a student who says, I didn't know that there was cultural genocide in Canada. I was shocked this international student says, that the Canadian students in class didn't know. And I want to share that even my 18-year-old students say, I knew a bit about residential school, but I didn't know this. I had no idea about the systemic racism in our justice system, in our healthcare system, in our universities. And so 
This is an international student who suddenly jumps and says, we need, our stu we need to require students to take a compulsory course in Indigenous studies. And we actually have two universities that have done that this last year. The University of Winnipeg and Lakehead University. And it's really interesting that a, a, almost a decade ago, the, indigenous, the founding members of the Indigenous Student Society at Acadia University came up with that very idea. And the founding president of ESA, Carrie Tatwini, a young Inuk from Nunavut, left Acadia to be closer to home and rank in Inlet, Inlet and went to the University of Winnipeg and took this idea with her. And it's enormously gratifying to see that we've got examples of student, student initiatives saying, we think we need to have a compulsory course so we can catch up on all the information that we should have known by now so we can make a positive difference. In the realm of none of it, and one of the students in my intro class some years ago was a pen writer in exile. And he was Acadia's artist in, in residence for two years, Benjamin Santa Maria. And one of the things that Benjamin said is that North America, or Turtle Island, is, is like a house. And in the basement is Mexico, and then the, the Arctic is the attic. And it's really easy to ignore what the needs and interests of the citizens who call those places home. And so what's required is a change of perception. In this case, have you looked at the world from a circumpolar perspective? And the flip side is, if we are going to decolonize ourselves, then there's a need, finally, for an epistemological and an ontological shift. We need to privilege indigenous voices, indigenous scholarships, the voices of elders and youth, in, and listen to them and learn from them, not learn about them. And that's what my students have been doing. I've, I've had some grants over the years and community-led initiatives, including this one, where we created the first ever interactive film with and for Inuit of Nunavut. And the idea, and we went on a physical voyage from Ihaliwit up to Cape Dorset. And along the way, we listened to Inuit, inclu including Kanojoak Ashavak, the renowned Inuit artist. Peter Irnuk here was the elder, the guide on this interactive voyage that you can go online and take. And we go out on the sea and we listen to to, to, to an elder talk about environmental stewardship. We go to Digis Island, which was renowned among Inuit as the place one went to for restorative justice. We went to Kimaruk, where we learned about uh, learning by doing, the education pedagogy of Inuit. And I was able to take Acadia students with me from psych, from business, from the Department of Politics, and, and that is an incredibly eye-opening experience. And they became supporters, facilitators of new content that is there for us to see. Sometimes the students can't come. And so in my classrooms, we look for ways for students to contribute. In this case, this was a student who took the voyage and then as an artist shared her artwork of the individuals you actually meet in the interactive voyage. So here we are, and this is the biggest jump one makes to get out of delusion and denial, not to turn the page, not, I think one of my students said this last week, and we may have said it as a class, yeah, this is uncomfortable, yeah, I don't feel well, and I now know that I need to have trigger alerts in my classrooms, and I say, if you have to go, take somebody out and go with you. And the, but the students have written in their quiet, reflective journals because you've got to make space to absorb what it is your what, what, what it is your your unlearning and what you're learning. And the students the students wrote this last week. I'm I'm not enjoying this. This is really hard. But people are living this, so I need to have the courage to at least unlearn all the misinformation, the disinformation that our schools and, and our other systems have still perpetuate. And then I need to learn by listening to and learning from 
our fellow citizens on whose land, unceded land, we're on. So that huge gap is interesting. And the best way I've found to get there, and the students are the ones who are guiding this pathway, is to break the boundaries of what we read and how we read. So in an intro politics class, and you won't be surprised, the very first book is not the textbook. The very first book, the first week, is read Richard Wagamese's Indian Horse. And then we bring in music videos from Ixwe or Tanya Tagak, for example, and art and so on. All these different ways of opening up our heart so that we can continue up the journey listening to and learning from indigenous peoples in a way that we can decolonize ourselves. And we, we talked about the north just now, but we also have to do it where we are. And I, and I live on unceded Mi'kmaq territory as a guest. And my university, as you said here, is, it occupies Mi'kmaq territory, unsurrendered <laughs> Mi'kmaq territory. And one of the things, as I said from the outset, that really is a game changer is connecting youth with indigenous elders. It actually is, again, another example of a student-led initiative. It's an Indigenous youth in one of my classes, Deb Tony, who nominated Doug Knockwood for an honorary doctorate from Acadia. Just like another student from, from Vancouver, Maya, nominated Elsie Charles Bass, the first Mi'kmaq woman to get a teaching degree. Um, and you can see, last year on March 21st, the United Nations Day for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, my students, as they have year after year in going through this, this decolonization process that they choose to go on, they said, we want to share what we're learning with the campus and the local community. So they had a teach-in. And they opened up and they shared. They had a round table with elders and a circle by the fireplace. And you can see the compassion in Morgan's face here. And she was so overcome with the journey that she'd been on by March 21st that Elder Doug Knockwood got off from the chair by the fireplace and put his arm around her. The key is that it is youth. It is our students. They are the ones who are showing us how to decolonize ourselves. We can sit and we can have multiple meetings, we can write books, but they are actually doing the heavy lifting. They're discovering their caring capacity and they're working to make a difference. I'll give you one more example. 10 years ago was the 10th anniversary of Nunavut. And my students said, we need to make a difference. We, there's a housing crisis. How can we get Southern Canadians to care? How can we let our pol pol elected political leaders know that this is not good enough? This is a basic human right. And so at the end of March, the beginning of April, on April 1st, 1999, was the creation of the new territory of Nunavut. And they created a 24-hour camp out for change. And it, it was a day, it was cold. They, they raised a yurt on the top steps of the University Hall just outside the president's, university president's office. They had a concert and they'd sent um, press releases. CBC, APTN were there. They did succeed in doing that, in raising awareness and trying to get people to care as they did. Discovering our caring capacity the willingness to do the heavy lifting. So there we are, and I want to show you. This is what we call the Hope Mural. And in 2015, the students organized the first ever four-day Mauiomi, which in Mi'kmaq means gathering. And for the first time at Acadia University, a sacred fire was lit. And students were invited to be by, by elders following protocols to be fire capers 24 hours a day over four days. We had guest speakers from Pam Palmeter to Shallon Jodry to Glenn Knockwood to a host of other people over four days. Again, the opportunities to listen to and learn from Indigenous peoples and build relationships. 
This post, this, this large mural was co-created by an indigenous artist and a non-indigenous artist who'd never met before. And they created it almost in the dark as night was falling, as we were outside and elders were on the stage telling their stories of, of how they were resilient and overcame uh, residential school. So this, this introduces something that happened last year, October 4th every year is the National Sisters in Spirit Day of Vigils, where we're supposed to take a moment, a day, <laughs> and remember missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. And as Indigenous students and community members have said, and men and boys, where's the inquiry, and whole families. And so the students decided, and you'll see there's uh, a young student who says, I have a vision of a flash mob. And just wait, I'll let the students talk for themselves. People have been blinded by this for many years. Um, but I think the mob that we're going to do at five um, is going to really open people's eyes. Um, and that's my goal is for people to have it hands on and what it was like to be um, an Aboriginal woman missing or a child missing or a man missing. As you notice, when we were taking people out, you connect back to each other. It took a little bit. This is what happens when we're, the people are taking our men and our women from our communities. Things get harder. Their circle gets weaker. Not only in families, but in the whole community. I think it was hard. I was holding my best friend's hand and then the next second she was gone. I think that's, it just, it's so, it was emotional. <laughs> Our people are affected by what's going on with the missing and murdered Aboriginal women and girls and men. A lot of our families are disconnected and our circles are broken, but we just keep going and we keep going. You were confused. It's like imagining what those women would have gone through when they were taken away. So that was, it kind of hit hard. That was the first time I heard about this. So that's why I came and attended this because I wanted to know more. I think this was a very powerful event. I mean, I think this is the most powerful event that I've been in the last four years. I know it's been going on for eight years. And so you have one example. This was actually a 20-minute documentary of, uh, by a student, Lara, together with two other students, Lauren and Eden, who'd never done anything like this, working with fellow students to cover, to create, and then to document this event. And what you can see here is that there's a journey to get over that guilt, that helplessness, to get out of the colonial mindset, to become change makers, and to create these new respectful relationships that the TRC called upon and that our governments have promised us. But we can't wait. And one of the things when we think that this is too much and that we've got other things that require attention, this is the journey that students have taken and it's one that takes them through a place where they're self-empowered as they decolonize themselves. Now you may have picked up a postcard on the way out or on the way in that asks you to share with us and students would like to see what you have to say. How are you decolonizing yourself? I'm a settler and I'm working really hard to decolonize myself and I'm grateful for the trust of students at my university, the support of the whole campus and the guidance of elders and other Indigenous community members.
Msit Nogama. Our last speaker, Dr. Heather Lawford, has spent about 15 years studying the power and potential of youth. Before joining Bishop's faculty, she did a postdoctoral fellowship with the Center of Excellence in Youth Engagement, led by the Students Commission of Canada, an organization that partners with youth to give youth voice a platform and help youth create the Canada they want. Last July, Dr. Lawford began her position as Canada Research Chair in Youth Development. Please welcome Dr. Heather Lawford to the stage. In preparing for today, I wrote a number of different speeches to try and tell you why I think youth engagement can make a real and lasting change. I wrote a speech about how Canada is not meeting the standards set out by the UN and the Conventions of the Rights of the Child, but that felt really far away from the work that I'm doing with my community. I wrote a speech about the promising practices that are happening in the research literature around youth engagement, but that felt like a lot to fit into 12 minutes. I wrote a speech about the trailblazing youth that we all see in the news who are inspiring us because they are making a change in fighting against gun violence and advocating for the rights for education for girls and arguing for effective cl climate change policies. But those are not the remarkable youth around me doing work. I even wrote a speech about myself and my own idealistic youth and how I wanted to change the world and the cynicism of my adulthood and how it grew out of so many failed goals. But that just made me feel really sad. So, as it turns out, the lessons that came from all of these speeches were the same. So let me skip to the end and tell you what I've learned from hanging out with youth engagement experts for the last 10 years. For me, the secret to youth engagement in affecting change boils down to three words, youth adult partnership. So for the next 10 minutes, I'd like to tell you a little bit about what youth adult partnerships are, what I've witnessed in what they can do, and maybe offer some suggestions about how you could incorporate youth adult partnerships in achieving your goals. Youth adult partnerships are not a program, they're a practice. It is the infusion of youth voice at all levels. It is the acknowledgement that youth engagement benefits all of us and matters far beyond a youth's personal development. Youth adult partnerships are co-created from the very beginning and they happen when both youth and adults share the same goal, the same purpose, and the same value. Now that is a beautiful idea in theory. But the reality is that youth adult partnerships can be tricky to practice. And in fact, both youth and adults can pose challenges in achieving youth adult partnerships. So let me start with youth. We have all experienced the power of youth. And in fact, now I think we collectively can say that we experience the power of youth today in the privilege of listening to the previous speakers. The energy that youth bring into the room, the creativity, that very refreshing, challenging of the status quo. My friend who's taught me a lot about youth adult partnerships, Heather Ramey, has a term for that rush that you get when you witness young people coming together to affect positive change. She calls it the youth conference high and we both seek it out at least once a year. <laughs> but sometimes it can be challenging to work with youth. 
they often don't have the same vocabulary as adults, and so that poses barriers to communication. Sometimes they're not aware of the amount of time and work it's going to take to achieve the goal that they've set for themselves. Young people tell us all the time that they have really important goals like reversing climate change and human equality. Great goals. But sometimes they don't have the experience to understand how many complex systems are involved in those goals. And that to work towards those goals, you might need to understand things like political agendas and economic realities and even logistical concerns. Without support, sometimes those obstacles can be impossible to overcome. And though their intentions are good, it's hard for them to reach those milestones. A couple of years ago, I heard David Hogg, 18 years old, one of the founders for March for Our Lives, say that he wanted us to start only voting for moral politicians. And I laughed to myself when I heard that at the naivety of that statement. But then I turned the lens on myself and I wondered, at what point did I stop believing in that idea? Electing moral politicians at all levels of government is idealistic, but it's also clear. It fits nicely in a tweet. And when it comes down to it, that's also what most of us as adults want. Since then, I've started listening to the goals of youth and realizing that they speak with a clarity that many of us as adults have lost. But as adults, we want clean air and clean oceans. We want everyone to feel safe. We want everyone to enjoy the privilege of opportunity. But when we dismiss the clarity of youth, we can sometimes lose our way. A couple of years ago, Maggie McDonnell came to Bishops to speak. Maggie won the World's Best Teacher Award for her work in Northern Quebec. She shared her journey with us, and this is what I learned. The youth of Salouet, Quebec, certainly have clarity. They want to feel safe. They do not want adults who don't understand their history and their way of life to dictate their reality. They want opportunity to achieve, and they want to stay connected to their roots and to their culture. Maggie heard this, and she partnered with these youth and together they co-created an agenda to begin a running program. She leveraged her position as an adult, focus on their health, and work on what turned out to be some very impressive athletic achievements. Maggie used the clarity of youth as her touchstone so that she didn't lose track of her purpose. And she understood that she could only be successful in her goals if she was willing to partner with youth who would share their energy, their creativity, and their clarity with her. The work that, of that partnership in Salouet, Quebec, spread across Nunavik, and it even touched us here in Sherbrooke, Quebec. Let me turn to adults. We have all had the privilege of meeting some pretty remarkable adults. There have, they have lists of impressive accomplishments, and they have titles that open doors that we thought would always be closed, or maybe we didn't even know those doors were there. They're wise and they're articulate, 
but working with adults can be really difficult. They get tired easily. And they're not willing to stay up late when those really good ideas emerge. Sometimes their cynicism blocks them from believing that big change is possible. Many adults have stopped making room for informal interactions and making room for unstructured time when creativity can really blossom. And maybe most of all, because we hear this from youth a lot, Adults ask for youth voice. They ask for youth work. They ask for youth opinion. But instead of responding to that voice, collaborating with those youth, they pat themselves on the back, or as my student Emily told me, they check the youth engagement box, and then they go about with their original plan. I've seen a lot of youth turn away from adults for exactly these reasons. But adults have the experience to understand the complexity of the issues that we're facing. And they can work within these complex systems and develop very impressive strategies. So when youth dismiss the complexity of adults, they are denying themselves powerful allies to help them overcome the obstacles that lay ahead. Let me give you an example. A few months ago, I had the wonderful privilege of helping to create a workshop that included about 50 youth from across Canada, most of them under 18, many of them facing economic and other barriers. There were also adults who represented social work, police, psychology, academia, and government. We were there to better understand how we could counter violent extremism in Canada. Over the course of those few days and in the days that followed, a number of the youth from that workshop pitched ideas of programs, and events that they thought would help contribute to our goal. And in fact, one of the funders from Public Safety Canada invited those youth to turn those ideas into grant proposals for the Community Resilience Fund that's coming due in a, in a month or so. So what did these youth do? They partnered with the adults from the Students' Commission of Canada from the Organization in the Prevention of Violence, from the Canadian Practitioners Network in the Prevention of Extremist Violence, because the adults affiliated with these organizations have access to experts, to relevant research. They have experience writing grant proposals. They can support young people in honing their ideas full of creativity and innovation so that those ideas are resilient to the complex obstacles that inevitably lie ahead. Those youth allowed adult complexity to move them forward, not push them down. The programs that are going to be initiated by those youth in partnership with their adult allies are going to be a major contribution in this country's efforts to counter violent extremism. So, how can you incorporate the practice of youth adult partnership to reach your goals? Well, if you're here as part of the Maple League, I have great news, you're in a really good place. The Maple League is a wonderful context to, for to forge youth adult partnerships. Youth in the Maple League not only have clarity, they have remarkable drive. They are not just our leaders for tomorrow, they are our leaders today. 
And let me say that again directly to the young people because I know that a number of my colleagues share this sentiment. You are not just the leaders of tomorrow, you are leaders today. Adults in the Maple League already believe in the power of youth. What's more, they are a bridge, not only to the allies of the here and now, but to the allies who live in the pages of history, of literature, of science, of art. And these adults can connect you to the great thinkers who also share your goals and purpose. Because we know that the most complex problems are going to be solved by the liberal education model. From there, it's time to find your partners and engage in a conversation. Engage in these conversations and find your partners in your classroom, in school events, in school clubs, even online. Once you've identified your partners, co-create your agenda. A couple of small tips of co-creating an agenda. Make sure that it is flexible enough that you are allowing for the adaptations that come with the evolution of your partnership and that you are acknowledging all of the gifts, abilities, capacities of your partners. Beware of jargon and allow yourself to be called out on your jargon because jargon limits who gets to participate in the conversation. Create both formal spaces and informal spaces for voice. Create spaces for voice to be expressed in the written word, in the spoken word, even in art. And above all else, keep respect at the center of every interaction. So what happens when you partner the clarity of youth with the complexity of adulthood? Wisdom becomes infused with energy. Creativity becomes infused with strategy. And intention turns into endurance. And that is when we will see real and lasting change. Thank you. Thank you so much for spending the afternoon exploring ways in which young people can advance human rights and the partnerships that youth and adults can work together to make the world a better place. You've heard from many different perspectives how hope <laughs> is messy and the journey towards effecting change is often over contested conceptual terrains. It is not easy, it is hard, we have a long way to go, and yet there's a lot of inspiring narratives that we can take from this. The complexity and the clarity are both on show today in all of the narratives that we heard. Uh, I'd like to thank you for listening with generosity and with the understanding of learning with the pedagogy of hope understanding uh, through Ira Shore's ideas in empowering students that hope is challenging the actual in the name of the possible. And we certainly got some toolboxes today, we got some models, and we got some pathways forward. So I'd like to invite you to carry those conversations out into the world, um, to share some conversations today in Bandine Lobby, but also think about how to partner, if you are youth, with some adults who understand complexity, but don't go to bed too early. <laughs> and if you're an adult, make sure you open yourself to the, the messiness and joy of those informal collisions with people who have incredible things to share with us. Thank you so much, and enjoy the rest of your day.